Um, first of all, John Lang is an international investor, originator, and developer of P3 projects. Um, we have a pretty long history of doing this. We've been uh, invested in over 130 projects so far that have spanned essentially across all sectors of P3, yeah. including health, yeah. justice, accommodations, and transit and transportation. Um, so we have a keen interest in this transit, uh, in the transit sector of the business. Over the past several years, we've been particularly focused on transit as, a, as an infrastructure sector uh, and invested in many projects, including the $8 billion, $8 billion inner city express program in the UK. Um, and like many in the room here uh, and across the industry, I think John Lang recognizes that while there have been challenges in transit projects in P3, it is a sector that continues to be an important area of growth and innovation in P3 delivery, as well as a key contributor to the sustainable development and evolution of our large urban centers. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator of the panel uh, this morning, who is Chantelle Sorel from SNC-Lavalin. Chantelle is the Executive Vice President and Managing Director of Capital at SNC. She's also a Director of the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. Chantelle is responsible for the investment and asset management business at SNC. Uh, which invests capital in projects and manages the company's multi-billion dollar portfolio of infrastructure invest investments. Over her career, she has had numerous management positions and has led engineering and construction projects in sectors such as mining, railroads, and power transmission. And with that, please welcome me and welcome Chantel to the stage. So. Uh, we have a, a very interesting panel today, uh, and here with me um, on the stage, we have uh, John Lamotte. John is Chief Executive Transport for Greater Manchester. Thank you, John, to join us today. We have Amanda Farrell, President and CEO of Partnership BC, and Aaron Corey, President and CEO, Infrastructure Ontario, and Director of the C2P3 as well. So the thematic we will go is the getting on the board of the next gen transit. And in fact, this panel, what I asked to our panelists here is to debate. Because in Quebec, where I'm from, uh, hockey is our national you know, sport, but the second one is election and politics, and we love debate. So I said I would like, I would like this panel to not be completely static, but rather, you know, if, you, if they don't have the same opinion, I said just wave at me, and I will make sure that you will have time to uh, discuss among yourself. Uh, we will uh, start with a very, uh, I would say, challenging situation, uh, the PPP framework. We all hear, we heard the minister this morning saying that we want to attract more money and uh, get all the, the money, you know, to build this infrastructure. But the problem is that the politics is increasingly challenging. It's an area around the world that where it's very difficult. I was in the UK a couple of weeks ago, came back, and days ago, all enthusiastic about what we can do there in terms of P3. And then on the Monday, the, the, when they announced the budget, they said, no PF2 anymore. PF2 is another word for P3. So we said, wow, what is going on there? And at the same time, later in that week, they say, ah, oh, maybe we'll go P3. We, have, we are living the same thing in the BC where uh, they uh, are open for uh, PPP, but at the same time, we see much more DBF project coming on than PPP. And then in Ontario, there is a brand new government looking for cost saving. Meanwhile, we have the US, the Australian, the Canadian government with the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, for example, that are saying, we want to set the context to get private money in, but there is no P3 projects. So uh, the elephant was in the room, so we decided to have this first question to our panel. So I will start with John. John, facing those contradictive trends, how are you dealing with the volatility in the political arena? And after last week, you're pretty well placed to talk about that. And ensuring progress on transit move forward, also taking into account the need for capital to finance those projects. Well, thanks very much. Uh, so I suppose I ought to start by declaring my experience, which is I was in 2008 the finance director in defense procurement when we tried to put together the largest private finance initiative, which was for the future tanker aircraft. And that was about 13 billion pounds for 27 years. Um, 2011, uh, I was chief executive for Tube Lines, which was PPP for uh, the London Underground infrastructure and maintenance. Uh, and more recently, I've actually been involved in winding up uh, a private finance initiative for uh, waste disposal across the whole of Greater Manchester. So I guess I've lived through some of the, uh, the process that we've gone through of the initial enthusiasm back in 92 for P3, 
uh, development of uh, PFI as a, as a scheme, an acceleration of that in 98. Uh, and then one or two things have happened to lead up to what happened last week. So we've had some things around scope. Uh, so we've had hospitals come in uh, with a couple of floors mothballed as soon as they were introduced. Uh, we've had issues of service. So in very recent weeks, we've had a prison handed back to government uh, because the company admitted that they couldn't actually uh, provide the service to run that prison. Uh, we've had issues uh, around uh, some of the level of uh, profit uh, that it's perceived that some of the operators are making, uh, and that's not gone down terribly well. And what that's also had a side effect of is where we've cut local authority budgets by roughly 37% in the last five years. It's silted up the program by saying, you've got this PFI that you've got to pay for for lots and lots of years, so your level of discretionary spend is actually very, very small. So when you want to do different things, uh, it's difficult. And then you have this level of inflexibility. Uh, so that manifests itself as, for example, on the waste disposal. Ten years ago, um, the ideas we had on landfill and how we wanted to burn rubbish uh, were fine. But today, when we want to recycle, uh, we want to do different things. They're no longer relevant. But changing that contract is not easy. So there's been all of those things. Now, if you were in HM government right now, you'd point to 700 PFIs, uh, 56 billion pounds worth for hospitals, schools, prisons. Uh, and would they have been done without this? No, they wouldn't. There's no two ways about it. And there's some really, really good things about involving the private sector uh, and private sector funding and finance. But there are some other sides to it as well. So when we come to look at this from a transit perspective, we're looking for 15 billion pounds worth of investment over the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, my colleagues in Transport for the North, the whole of the north of England, are looking for 70 billion pounds. Um, my colleagues in London are looking for Crossrail, uh, 31 billion pounds. We're looking for innovative ways of providing finance. We're looking for innovative ways of involving the private sector. And I've no doubt we'll talk about market sounding later on as to some of the ways we're looking at that in a rather different way than PFI, which hasn't necessarily worked for us. So thank you, John. So Aaron, a lot of people are coming at this conference. It's always the event where you release your pipeline. So over the last years, uh, we were very anxious to hear what would be the IO pipeline coming. But we just heard that uh, you will not do that this year. So can you share with some insight into IO's pipeline going forward as you work with new, very cost-conscious government? So at least give us some end of what is coming. Of course. Um, thanks, Chantal. I wanted to, I, I was going to make a joke about if everyone looked under their seat, they'd find VR glasses and put them on and they'd see the pipeline based on your <laughs> cool video this morning. But no, we're not releasing a pipeline this year, it's true. And uh, we had a pool in our uh, office, how many times the word pipeline, we would discuss it over these two days. So you're adding to, I bet the over, so you're helping. Um, the new government is cost conscious, and so they're doing a really system that it's well documented, and our Minister of Infrastructure will be speaking tomorrow, I'm sure you'll hear more from him, but they're doing a really systematic review of expenditure on the, on the cost side, and they're also looking at projects pretty carefully, reviewing the business case and the justification. Um, so in the coming months, we'll have an updated pipeline, pipeline to publish. But I think what the audience can take away, what we've been seeing in the early days, are a few things. One, uh, th this government's been really clear that it still sees an important role for the private sector in the delivery infrastructure projects. That's been part of their messaging from day one. Um, and so more, and I think they're looking at P3s in the broadest sense. So what are all the ways that the private sector can contribute to the delivery of infrastructure? Second, I think it's really clear that while they, yeah, they're cost conscious to use your phrase, they're also very aware of the value of infrastructure in terms of both economic development and social outcomes for the people of Ontario. So I don't think there's, and, and they're, they're, they've been pretty clear in what those priorities are around um, healthcare and transit and transportation in particular. So I think there is an important pipeline of projects. I think they see a need for the private sector in new and maybe more innovative ways. So I think we're going to have a chance to try a lot of things in the coming years. And the last thing I'll say is, while the, we aren't publishing a new pipeline, our projects have continued. We've had, uh, this fall, I've been to groundbreakings at a number of our projects. Our procurements that are in the market have continued. 
there's been no pullback on the stuff we're currently doing. What, the, what I think they are doing is looking at the longer term and just reassessing which projects, uh, how to prioritize them to fit with their priorities. So that's, that's, that's where we're at in terms of a pipeline. But actually, it's been a really positive discussion so far in terms of the future likelihood of projects and the role of the private sector in those projects so, so far. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, Amanda, this question is not on the script, uh, but um, <laughs> about a few weeks ago, we and our partner put together the RFQ for Surrey. And in the room here, I see our partner, I see our competitors, that our other team did, did the same. A lot of work done, we were very proud uh, the RFQ was in and so on, and then bang, two weeks ago, change of mayor on a Sunday, and now we're not sure about what is going on with Surrey. Can you well, tell us a bit? Thank you for that question, Chantal. <laughs> and I, I've had that question a few times already um, <laughs> since I've been here, and uh, obviously um, there are some questions now going forward. Um, we, we have extended the RFQ, uh, while there's this period of, of uncertainty about what will happen next. The councils in, in BC will mostly be sworn in today, um, and the next uh, milestone will be uh, TransLink's Mayor's Council meet on November the 15th, and we, we were, we're awaiting some direction from, from that meeting. Um, so in the meantime, <laughs> I know today we're going to talk about some of the contractual structures and things that we've been working on for Surrey, so we're going to continue to talk about those because we've done a lot of work on it. But in terms of uh, where we go from here with the RFQ, we're going to have to wait and see on that November 15th. Okay, so it is what it is. So the second thematic will be about project delivery because uh, it's great, you know, to first go and win those projects and then uh, the challenge is to deliver them. So uh, the first question is to Erin. Um, through the, the P3 model has been great track record across Canada of on-time and on-budget delivery. Transit has been a new and more challenging sector for on-time performance in Canada. Can you talk about some of the challenges and risks you are encountering in this asset class versus the other one, like social infrastructure, roads? So what is the difference between the, the transit and the other asset class? Why is more challenging? For sure, Chantal. Um, it's interesting. I'm also reflecting on John's comments when, when we started and your lessons from PFI, what has and hasn't worked. And I think here's the thing. Delivery models are just, what's the, the expression? Democracy is the worst form of government except all the other forms. <laughs> yeah. Delivery models are just, there, there's no perfect answer to this. Pro, large projects, transit projects, uh, uh, buildings too. They are large, complex infrastructure projects, both in their construction and also in their long-term maintenance. And they're not all going to go perfectly. Um, and I think we have to learn from that each and every time. Because if we, if we presume that there's a model that solves the inherent problems, I think we're already on the wrong foot. So we are, we've really been focused on learning from the transit projects we've done so far. There's obvious things. I mean, transit projects have uh, a couple of fundamentals to them. There's one. They are the mix of green and brownfield type of assets. So we're, it's much easier if I say, go behind that hoarding, here's a big open field and build us a brand new asset. It's much different when you're dealing with a mix of age and infrastructure. You, you're not building an hyper loop in the desert. That's what you mean. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. And in fact, it's interesting. Look at our, many people in this room work on our building site. In many of our generations of social projects now, hospitals, courts, they're often an integration between existing mm -hmm. and new infrastructure. And so they have some of the same problems. It's not just a transit thing, but definitely that mix uh, creates complexity. The disruption to communities and, again, and you're not behind hoarding in one place. You're working in, usually in an urban environment. That has a big impact. Doing things like pricing disruption, pricing congestion, having lane rentals and concepts like that built in, we think are really important because you have to try and put value on someone doing the project in a less disruptive way and doing it quicker. So I think that's been a real learning for us. And the social license that comes with that, um, the, the need to constantly communicate, the need to be um, um, proactive with stakeholders, the number of stakeholders for sure has been a big difference for us. As you know, in Ontario, <laughs> we've We've worked on community benefits agreements, or how do you make sure that the community feels the benefit during what can be a challenging uh, construction project? 
And the last thing I'd say that's been interesting for us in transit, or, or again, it's, it's true in the buildings, but even more so in transit, has been the level of partnering between local and global firms. And that's a great strength and a wonderful thing, but it, it also has some growing pains too, probably some growing pains for you and, and your partners. And we've been seeing that as well. We know it's the right model, so it's been really successful for us, we think, in places when you've got strong local contractors partnered with people who might bring global expertise um, and experience in the asset class. But that's been a challenge for us as well that we're working through, I think, with you, with the market. Yes. So thank you, Aaron. The next question, Amanda, but the three of us, uh, I would like to have your opinion after Amanda answer this one because it's also something that touched you a lot in Ontario, and I, I would be curious to know how you do that in UK. But it's about rolling stock. Some recent projects have been plagued by rolling stock delays. I will just pass to name which one because we all impacted with that. And our quality issue. Do you believe that transferring this delivery risk to the private sector partner can be priced efficiently going forward? You have many school of thought, so that's why yeah, I'd like there, to hear the other are, ones. There are, there are many yeah. schools of thought, and we spent a lot of time looking at this as, as part of developing the Surrey project and looking to, to, to lessons sort of across the country. And where we landed was that we did think that the bidders should have the rolling stock integrated into the project. We think that's the right place for the vehicles to be from a schedule perspective. Um, but we were concerned about not limiting the pool. So what we did was with the RFQ, we didn't ask for the vehicles to come forward um, to, to preserve as great a pool as possible um, for the, the shortlisted um, bidders to go and pick from. And then the idea would be to have a certain amount of specification, but, but leave open um, some, some opportunity for innovation and partnership at that, that proposal stage. So that's where we landed after sort of looking around. I know there's many different models. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we actually look at our RER program that we're in market on right now. We've done the same. So let me back up. I think I, one thing I didn't say, Chantal, when describing the challenges or the unique challenge of transit, maybe it's the biggest one, frankly, is the level of integration Mm -hmm. that it requires across systems, vehicles, hard infrastructure, and technology. And that's the whole point of doing some form of P3, is to get the private sector, rather than, than right. us trying to play that integration role yes. through, the, through the life of the asset. There's also really interesting trade-offs between investment in infrastructure versus more rolling stock, and we're seeing that on some of our projects. And that's the creativity and the innovation we're trying to give to the side of the private sector. So we think it's incredibly important um, to have a rolling stock, at, at our starting point at least, is that that should be part of an integrated solution that a bidder brings. They can make really smart choices. Do they want to own it or lease it? Do they want to invest in fleet or, or other forms of infrastructure? Um, so that, that's kind of our, where we've landed too. I think the interesting thing is how there's a, so I want that integration. I think a different question is how, puni how, how much does your regime put cost risk on bidders around vehicle delivery, on lateness? What's the, Late what's the regime around yes. delay? Because I want the integration, but there's also an economic yes. choice that you have to think about whether it's an affordable uh, option. So we're, we're playing with balances of that. Okay, excellent. And John, can you tell us a bit how it mm -hmm. works in the UK? Yeah, uh, so uh, on heavy rail, uh, we have a system of rolling stock uh, owning companies, um, and they're basically providing um, leased uh, trains to the train operating companies. And, and you can argue whether that's the best way of doing it. Um, it is the way we do it. I'm not saying it, it is necessarily the best, uh, but certainly those rolling stock um, owning companies have responsibility for providing something that works. So when it turns up, it has to work, and the operators basically have to just train the drivers and, and drive them away, uh, and it's fine. Um, you find that on metros, uh, you like um, on ours or in the Northeast uh, or in Liverpool, uh, they've tended to buy their own uh, rolling stock, um, certainly for their replacements. Um, I am, would emphasize your point of earlier, though, it's the integration that matters. Um, just ask Crossrail about the integration of a system and what 
testing and coordination needs doing when you mixing four different signaling systems with new rolling stock that hasn't been tried before. Uh, it's a complicated problem. Mm -hmm. yes. And to finish uh, this uh, te thematic on a positive note, uh, John, in Manchester, you were able to overcome utility risk, which is always a risk that uh, we, we don't like. It's a, it's a big risk. And complete an airport link in a link in a year ahead of schedule, a year ahead of schedule. What were the success factors on that project? Uh, it's probably worth just saying a word about uh, Metrolink. Since 2010, we've trebled the size uh, of Metrolink. It's been about a three billion uh, investment to do that. Um, and some of the new lines have been either using old railway lines, but this airport link, which is 14 and a half kilometers, uh, is entirely street running. Um, biggest problem with the street running scheme is when you dig it up. You manage to annoy most residents and most businesses. So the biggest thing that causes time problems is utilities. So what we had was a joint utilities uh, team, um, a joint utilities working group where we got all the utility companies in together. Uh, we had the local authorities in together, the highways authorities, uh, the national bodies as well, all in the room. And they had a single priority, which was delivery of the project. That was it. There was no uh, misalignment of priorities. Uh, and so what we did was to have one lead utility provider for that section, and they would provide the utilities for everybody else. Uh, we had a protocol for uncharted utilities. Um, it always just amazes me how little we know what goes on under there, uh, still less the utility companies. Uh, but actually, we had a response time of, um, at worst, five days, but mostly done within 24 hours. So you could really nail these things quickly and get on and, and get things done. Now, that's didn't just happen, that's on the back of using the same construction organization, um, Talis is, is our consortium that supported us on the expansion of Metrolink. They've worked with us now for a better part of nine years. Um, that a length of time of extension after extension, uh, same team, we know them, they know us, uh, and it works incredibly well. Uh, they build up the relationships with local authorities, total trust, and so suddenly on utilities alone, we saved nine months and about nine to 10 million pounds just on that utilities bit, and that's how you can get to open things early. So that was a real public-private partnership. The word partnership was important in the this one, which often title. is left you know, aside, it's like, uh, public and private that kind of fight to each other rather than being partner, but in this case, it was a pure example of what a partnership can bring on Absolutely value. right. That's excellent. So I think it's a good lesson learned for us So um, here in Canada, because sometimes we're a good partner and other it does not work that well. So we have to, uh, I would say, uh, uh, feed, you know, this uh, aspect of partnership among the private and the, the public. But I do have a question on the, the cost angle of that, and was it, was it cost shared, or who took the risk on so, that? So we shared the incentives to, to open it early. Now, you know, it, it wasn't huge amounts of money to, to open it early, but it, it made it worthwhile for the team. Uh, so for the construction team, yep, they certainly got some financial benefit out of it. Uh, and I did we, obviously, because we were getting into revenue state uh, that much earlier as well. Um, but the public reputational aspect of it, yeah, yes. of getting it done early, yes. frankly, you couldn't put a price on that. Uh, and that's what gives you the trust for them to say, yeah, go away and do the next <coughs> program. Uh, so when we went to do the uh, second sit, um, city crossing um, and d dug up the center of the city, there were no public complaints. You know, there was no worries about it, which is, which is you know, what the, the side benefits are. And we were able to say, okay, to the airport, well, actually, we've opened up down there. Um, the National Rail people wanted a new platform. We said, it's all right, we're down there, we'll do it for you. They wanted a new road put in. So we said, yeah, it's fine, we've got the team, we'll do it. One kilometer of extra road. Uh, and, and you can, you know, once you've built these relationships, yeah. you can do so much more. Mm -hmm. So good, that's a very good example to uh, look at. So talking about the PPV model, um, Amanda, I know we said that uh, Surrey is tall, but it's still an, a, a different model than what we have been uh, used to see in terms of delivery. And I think that in, in spite of the situation, it were to talk about that. So uh, can you uh, tell us, you know, on the Broadway extension, it was always assumed to be a DBF, but impending politics aside, can you tell us about how you got the modified DBF-OM model for the Surrey LRT? Uh, 
what were the driver for a shorter O&M period and how the industry responded to that? Okay. It's seven years, isn't it, the O&M? Yeah, it's, uh, it's seven years of operations after construction. So, um, yeah, we spent a, a, an inordinate amount of time um, looking at different models for Surrey, and there's a couple of drivers for that. Um, the first was the, the, this uh, Surrey-Newton-Guilford line is the first of two phases, with the second phase to come on about, in about 10 years. So that we were very concerned about the expansion piece and how that was going to work. Um, the, the second driver was, was a lot of interest in, tr in TransLink of actually operating and maintaining it themselves. Um, so we looked at a, a range of different lengths of, of, of operations terms. Uh, I think over time we talked to, to TransLink about what it would take for them to get organized to operate and maintain a brand new system. We have no RRT in, um, in British Columbia. Um, and we talked to the market about the different lengths and seven years is, is, is not uncommon in some operating contracts. Um, so, so we landed here in what we thought would sort of balance getting the operation up and running, working out any bugs, um, transitioning across to TransLink if they choose to at the seven year mark. We were very nervous about, um, we knew some parts of the market were quite concerned about this, some were, were more open and we were, we were worried about what kind of a response we were gonna get. But I can tell you that we got a very strong response at the bidder meeting and we had a full house. So we were very pleased about that. Of course, we don't know what the next uh, page of this book is gonna look like, but uh, that was how we, how we sort of got here. Mm -hmm. Any comment from uh, Aaron or John on that? Or? Well, there's some similarities to what we've been doing on our RER program as we've gone out um, in thinking about the operating term and how, what the right length for that is, as people in the room know probably. We've, we've thought about how do you ring fence the operations. For, we, we want the long-term thinking. We want the people who design and build the asset to have long-term maintenance responsibility, but we're also thinking what's the right length for an operating term. So we're playing with mechanisms to allow you to ring fence that operations. Um, and I think, Amanda, the other thing you said, and, and John, you talked about it as well, perhaps the biggest question on our mind is how do you manage the fact that these are all living, breathing systems? It's, it's not, it's it's not build it once and then run it for 30 years yes. and then give me back the keys. And I'm actually not sure that that's ever really been the right way to think about this model across all asset types, but for sure in transit it, it isn't. And so you have to be thinking much more about how is it going to continue to evolve and what will the next phases look like. And I don't think the versions that we've done of, of uh, P3s historically have been, in Canada and Ontario in particular, have been really well set up for that. So you're into a, a separate negotiation partway through when you realize there's an unexpected change. And so we're thinking about that much differently now in our new transit projects. But also because the projects are becoming larger and larger and complex, like uh, we've talked about the RER, it's a, it's a very, very large project. Uh, how do you, uh, how the Ontario market is addressing that? How do you address that to not the, to, to address those very large and complex projects that are coming? Uh, I would say when I, started my career, you were talking about a half of a billion dollar project, it was a huge project. And today, you know, uh, two, three billion dollars seem to be average and even not that big. And now you have 10 million dollar project. The Grand Paris is now, I think, at 40 million euro, a billion euro, it's another story. But how do you foresee addressing those very large projects? Well, I, don't, I think it's a, you have to look at both the size of the project, but more importantly, the size of the risk. So we're more obsessed about making sure that the risk that the private sector is being asked to take is reasonable and can be managed by the private sector. This, transit projects are, are large. You're absolutely right. I mean, they're, they're, they're big. So are energy projects. There, there are projects that are bigger. That's just naturally their scale. Breaking them up into smaller sizes, I think, does much more damage than good because we talked earlier about integration. I think taking a, a project that is a system, that has to work as a system, that has to function effectively and trying to break it into a bunch of chunks with government agencies as the integrator of that is a, is a very risky proposition. So what we're more interested in thinking about is how do you manage the size of the risk effectively? And that could be things like uh, making sure that there's some sharing on key risks. So let's use an example. RER is, a, is a, in the largest project we're currently working on. It's in market. 
we looked at it and said utilities to use John, your example earlier is a really big risk here. And we talked to the market a lot and we did much more market sounding before we ever got to an RFQ than we've ever done before at white papers submitted by industry. We tried to listen really carefully. And one of the things that led us to was saying there's a whole bunch of utility work that actually, I talk about the importance of integration, but that it can be done ahead of time. And so if we can go ahead and clear the way in with several years before we're going to have a partner on board and be shovels in the ground, how much of the utilities work can we pull forward? And instead of therefore arguing about who's going to take the risk and arguing risk transfer, let's re do risk reduction. Okay. So we're going out in the field with, with Metrolinks and doing, uh, I lost count, but it's 70 or so individual projects to move or relocate utilities in ways that will allow, now, someone might say, yeah, but if you wait, the private sector might have come up with an innovative design that didn't require, because a lot of these are, are crossings, a lot of our utility issues, because this is in the right of way of a heavy rail system. The, so people have said to us, yeah, but if you wait, it might turn out someone can design an electrification system that didn't even require that utility to be moved. Maybe. Maybe. But in, by and large, what we're trying to do is take down the risk profile of the project. If there are places where we see really big choices, a bridge that might need to be raised or might not, we're leaving that and we're gonna let the consortia who wins decide that and, and make that choice. But if there's obvious things we can do to take the risk down, we're trying to make those up front. I just give that as an example of, you asked about big, and I think big's important, but maybe a different way of thinking about it is how do we manage risk um, so the private sector can the play their the role. Projects. So thank you for this uh, answer. And John, one thing that we hear a lot uh, is about uh, the unsolicited proposal, market-led uh, proposal, you call that in UK. We know in Canada, beside the RAM, there is not too many examples of that in infrastructure business. We know Australia is doing a bit of it, some part in the United States. But here in Canada, for complex projects, beside the RAM, we have not uh, seen yet uh, unsolicited proposal or market-led proposal. You do that in UK. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, those? Yeah, so I suppose the two projects that um, people would usually associate with this, one's called Thames Tideway. Uh, Thames Tideway is, is building a new sewer system. Uh, it's not the most sexy thing in the world, but absolutely vital for London to try and divert the sewage <coughs> away from the Thames. Uh, and that uh, went into a different approach, really, uh, from the conventional, where we, the Department of Transport and Government looked at all the various alternatives to whether to do it purely as public sector, whether to do it as Thames Water as the uh, utility company, or whether to have a separate infrastructure provider. Uh, and in the end, they went for a, a separate infrastructure provider on a uh, DB uh, FNM uh, type project, uh, Basel Jet. Uh, and they're doing the tunneling uh, later this year, uh, and, and that should work pretty successfully. That's, so that's one uh, example where it's going, it's working. The other one is uh, a southern rail link into London Heathrow. Uh, there aren't terribly good linkages uh, by rail into Heathrow from the south. So what uh, the Department for Transport have done is go out to the market to say, well, what do you think would be the right solutions here? So uh, it's important to, to say, what the outcome they want, not what the solutions might be. It's what outcome do you want, and then let the private sector give us some better ideas about, well, here's some ways of doing it. Too often I hear uh, private sector say, well, if we knew that that's what you wanted, we would have told you much earlier a better way of doing it. And that's, that's I think, a, a big lesson for us. So when they get the, um, the proposals in, how are they going to manage competition? After that, so so, so uh, this is sort of early contractor involvement right. in a, in a sense. There's still a, a formal procurement process to go through. We we uh, have EU rules to follow, uh, but certainly doing market sounding and soft market testing uh, and producing some of these ideas in a sort of a lower cost way to the market is a good way of introducing it before we have a sort of more of a, uh, a formalized process. And to protect the IP, when the proponents are coming with an idea, can you give us a bit of an idea? The that, intellectual that one's, property? That, that, yeah. that one's more difficult because I'm not uh, uh, directly like, yes. on those projects. Yes, because we, we are going for uh, unsolicited proposal, for example, in our nuclear business when we have a technology and then it's pretty unique and so on. So the client is a bit, I wouldn't say captive, but if we go with this solution, there is not other bidder. So this is pretty transparent uh, to the public uh, what we do, but uh, in terms of uh, I, as a 
on the private side, I, I'm always worried with the IP when you come with a great idea and how the procurement uh, will be managed uh, down the road. So let's keep this uh, topic for maybe next year. But uh, it's an interesting one because most of the market are asking us today to come with uh, unsolicited proposal. I would say the price of putting those proposal together is maybe a, a bit of a turn off for the private uh, sector. And uh, you need to know there is a framework where you have the gating that will allow you to progress without spending a million and million of dollars. So, uh, but just put that on the side. Let's talk about that in another panel. So with the P3, uh, we saw over the years some start to be mature. And one of the issues that we meet is with the change, change man management. Uh, we have some of our assets we are, we are uh, managing at the moment that are confronted to those, uh, those uh, change. And I would like to hear a bit you, uh, the panel, about that and the risk allocation and those change. So in Canada, we have seen several recent LRT projects procure as P3 during the development and plane phase. Grapple grapple with how accommodate future extension expansion, example, in Mountain, Ottawa, Surrey. While the solution for each may be different, the UK network has been quite extensive. John, can you tell us from your experience, are there some common themes or insight that will help authority limit the roadblock to consider P3 as solution for LRT and also include future possibility for expansion? So I think there's some, uh, quite a lot of lessons to be learned from London Underground, really, uh, and two public-private partnerships were set up there. I mean, they were imposed by government. Um, Transport for London didn't want them, and the mayor of London didn't want them, um, which was probably one of the first hurdles uh, to get past, actually. Um, I think the, uh, the way that that unfolded with Metronet we're looking after nine lines uh, and got behind delivery, got behind delivery on stations. They were supposed to do refurbs. They didn't do them. Uh, they got uh, behind on rolling stock uh, and eventually they went into administration and had to be uh, taken in-house. Tube lines, different, uh, different story really, um, did extremely well on maintenance. Um, and provided a really good benchmark, actually, for the rest of London Underground, uh, but not so good on projects and wanted, needed some additional finance. So uh, what that led to is um, they didn't get as much finance as they wanted, and they had a real issue, uh, and that's ultimately what led to the PPP uh, folding. Um, what, what then happened was, as more projects were required on the Jubilee line and the Northern line and the Piccadilly line, it was harder to convince anyone to give them the tube lines the money to go and do them. Uh, because they looked at the background and said, well, how can we do that? Or, you know, what are you going to do with it? Uh, and there needed to be a change in uh, some of the people, frankly. There needed to be uh, a change in atmosphere. There needed to be some joint working, and one of the things I did was put all the people in one office together uh, to actually do some joint working to try and get the trust back, because it was the trust that really was the most important thing. And I, I think if, if there's one thing that comes back to your question about, so what's the, what's the golden thread? The golden thread is relationships and people, because uh, actually that's what makes all this work. Okay, thank you. So, Amanda, uh, I would say for SNC-Lavalin, uh, Canada Line is our post poster child, and uh, we are very proud of this project, about one of the first ones, and it was a, a bit of a shocker lately uh, uh, to go to BC and uh, to meet with the new CEO of TransLink that has stated that the system is underbuilt for future demand and that uh, the planner underestimated demand 15 years ago. So uh, we were a bit shocked. Uh, I see uh, my colleague here from ONM. we were together <laughs> when we went there last year. And I would like to know, uh, to the future, you know, can the existing P3 model be enhanced to make mid or late concession life expenses easier? Because after all, we build what we are asked to build in that time. Maybe the scope was more, uh, um, I would say, defined. But what can we do? to get P3 allowing this expansion in the future. Yeah, I, I would say easily, as these relatively easily. It, it, it's <clears> not <throat> going to be easy, but it's something we have to work on. And I'll start by saying Canada Line um, is extremely successful. Its ridership is, has, has exceeded um, expectations. It meets its performance indicators. People love it. And so it's a kind of a victim of its own success. Um, it's been operating for nearly 10 years, as you, as you say. And um, you know, it was one of the first P3s that we did. So it's, it's pretty um, light on considering what's, what's going to happen. And as Erin mentioned, the one thing that's certain in these projects is there's going to be change. Um, so we, ha we have, you know, we spent a lot of time, and Erin talked about listening carefully to 
the market, we've done a lot of very careful listening to TransLink because the, the things that would concern them about the Canada Line model aren't things that the public would see. They're, they're the, more these irritants and these processes of how do we, in a reasonable time frame, um, expand the service. So we're looking at various sort of levels, um, pre-priced yeah. service levels that you can, you can trigger um, on, a, on a fairly short time frame for um, bigger changes, trying to have some guiding principles around how that process is going to work in a time-bound um, period of time to get the work done. Um, so we think there's a lot you can do. But we do need to go into this saying that these things are going to change. I think there's also a lot of details in Canada Line that will be easy to fix. That we just that's why you have to listen. It's the small things like the customer um, experience um, and service, things like wayfinding, uniforms. We never thought about any of these things. But for the TransLink CEO, he wants his service to look the same. He doesn't want the customer to know, well, it's a different provider. Um, things like um, the way we do the cost transparency, so he can benchmark the cost of one service to another. So we think there's lots of things we can do, small, medium, and larger, with the model going forward that will provide that flexibility for the, peop for the people who are actually the end user and the operator and thinking about the customer experience. Excellent. Yeah, we don't, for us, Chantal, I think if up front the contract is structured, thinking ahead, to likely changes. And I'm not saying, I'm not sure, so there's a difference between legacy versus where yes. we're going. But on the ones we're doing now, let's talk about that if I, uh, I think we're much smarter about setting ourselves up for future expansion from a capital perspective. And I think actually that's the easiest. The, the, the cost of the infrastructure is the easy part because we can set up where our partner now can go out and get competitive tender and do bidding. We can have open book type of relationships to make sure that we're paying fair value. We can always have an option to go out and procure it ourselves if we don't like the price we're getting from our private partner. So the capital is the easy part. The harder for sure is the changes in service performance. So if we do an, ex if we do an expansion or if we add a station somewhere in the middle of the network or something like that and the whole payment mechanism is based on uh, service at uh, round trip travel times and reliability of service and now we change the service pattern in ways we didn't predict that's actually the harder part that we and I think industry together are trying to figure out how do those changes 15 or 20 years and we're not going to be able I, I agree with Amanda we should set differing service levels and be able to take ourselves up and we've done that on a project like Eglinton Yes. But we'll never be able to predict, I don't think, all of the future changes in service pattern. And, and that's the part that is, but you I think, more challenging allow, than the capital. But those change coming that we cannot foresee today. Yeah. So that, that's good news. It, it, it means that the P3 model has uh, had an evolution since the beginning. So there is hope that we will, with the time, have the best P3 model. And this is maybe my wrapping question before we go to the uh, question from the audience. Let's say you wake up this morning and uh, you are the uh, superhero of Petri, okay? And uh, with your uh, cape and so on, you go, what is the one thing you would do, uh, Aaron? I will ask to each of Me? you. Me? Oh, great. Um, <laughs> you can uh, change two, what you want. I tell you, I have two answers. One, listening to the sp speaker this morning, Leonard, I, th I think, if I, I guess if I could have one, we're, the problem is we're building long-term assets <laughs> in a period of incredible uncertainty. How much parking do we need at our stations? And how, what's first mile, last mile going to look like? And it's great to talk about where we'll be in the long run, but if that's five years or 10 years or 20 years away, it makes a big difference. So I guess uh, if I could have a superpower, the ability to, to uh, predict the future and see some of those key uncertainties would make a big difference. But I, I will just say the other part of your question, you know, at Infrastructure Ontario, we build... Our, we work with our partners to get stuff built. And we're called Infrastructure Ontario, not P3 Ontario. Or If I was a P3 superhero, I'd probably stay more kind of more Clark Kent and less Superman with the big <laughs> P3 on my Maybe chest. Because I think the truth is it's just good common sense. It's good contracting. We should be uh, uh, not drink too much of our own Kool-Aid sometimes and just know that there's a right model for every project. At I.O., we do projects that are $100,000. We don't... I don't rip off my cape and say, ta-da, we're here with, we're with our hammer to hit every nail. I think what we should do as P3 practitioners is focus on the right tool for the right job and uh, probably uh, keep our glasses and our suits on more than our cape. We, we saw in the previous presentation that AI could do very do 
good predictive, you know, assessment. So maybe with the coming of the big data, the mining and AI and the deep learning, exactly. we will be able to have this crystal ball and learn. So Amanda, you are, you are a superhero. Well, I, I, I can't beat that answer. So you I'm cannot not, beat I'm not this answer. Try. I, I do think there's, there's, there's two things. I think we have to really work hard on evolving our, our um, our model and our, our contract, and, and, and I 100% agree with Aaron. It's about the right, a right tool for the right job, and it's not about um, the, trying to get away from the ideology and trying to get back to um, what the right thing to do is. Uh, and then I, I still do think um, we still have the problem of probably too much prescription on us on the owner side. We still we still are dogged by that, and trying to. Uh, really let some of the amazing ideas and opportunities flow. I mean, we've seen you know, the, the videos you've shown and the, the, the things that are out there are changing so fast and we do have to leave, leave some room for that to come into our process. Excellent. And John? So as a transit CEO, <laughs> I'd probably say that the one thing that I want to care, uh, pay attention to, I don't really mind how we uh, come up with a solution, but we got customers at the end of the day, uh, and the customers are the people that really matter, and we have to provide the right solution for them. And the other thing is the stakeholders, and I, including them, the public, who are affected by whatever solutions we're coming up with, and providing something in a way that treats them with respect as well, such that they've got the confidence to go out and do it again, because that's the only way we build success. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So thank you. Uh, that What's we, uh, your superpower, Chantal? My superpower, <laughs> uh, I think it will be very similar uh, to you, is to be able to predict. And uh, I would say uh, allow for change as well, uh, is, uh, uh, and be able to agree between the public and the private party of how we will resolve and take quick decision on those change. Because the problem, if we build today the infrastructure that we have, we think we will build and deliver it, like in five years, you will not deliver the right thing. So to have this flexibility, agility together to take the right decision in a timely manner to make it happen, this is what I would wish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Um, so now we have questions from the audience. Uh, so we have uh, three questions. The first one, uh, you will tell me who wants to answer to this one. It's not specific. Should transit infrastructure investment proposal consider benefit beyond time saving and ridership to things like economic growth and access to jobs? So who wants to answer? You can, uh, John. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yes, I do. I mean, in in any um, proposition that comes up in UK. Uh, you would traditionally evaluate it on journey time benefits, but these days it's all about transport is not an end in itself, it's just a tool for economic growth. So we would absolutely measure uh, the job benefits, the social benefits, the social value of the project, uh, all of those things, and that, that's frankly what matters, and that's what will get the thing over the line these days. Thank you. Yeah. It's the same, same in BC. I mean, we certainly, uh, the cost-benefit analysis looks at much broader than just um, yeah. travel time. Yeah. Good. And John, uh, is the utility relocation work done as an early work in your project? Yes, absolutely. Like and, it, and, and that's the easiest way of doing it, is taking these things, anything that we can take out and identify as early works, we would do. Uh, and utilities is, is the easiest one to do. And it, it, it makes things go a lot smoother. Okay, and the last one is a bit of a tricky one because uh, you were talking about seeing the future. I'm not sure you, you can or want to answer to that. Is what specific milestone need to be achieved before autonomous vehicle networks replace, eliminate the need of large public transit system? And I would say, I think it's very interesting because will really, in my view, autonomous vehicle can replace large mass transit because in fact it's still vehicle on the road, you know? Even if they're more efficient, it's still packing people in the vehicle rather than the, that takes. A, is it really a solution? I don't know. I would like. It would be a good debate to have all together. So, what do you think? Will it replace one day? Well, I, the large I, public transit system. I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I know the answer to the question. But I'll just say this: the way we have to think about all of these investments, and it's hard. But as public sector, this is what we're doing day in and day out: is thinking about them at a system level. So. And I know we always talk about having an output focus or an outcome focus. In, it's one of the hallmarks of P3s. I think in Ontario, we've done a decent job at it. I think we're really pushing ourselves now even further that what we're looking for is outcome-based solutions that we're buying. So to answer the question a different way, ultimately, if 
we go out and say what we're looking for is mobility solutions and someone to give us a integrated mobility solution, which, and we haven't gotten there yet, but I could see us one day yes. saying, I'm not going to do an, I don't know, an expansion of the, of the RER network. I'm going to say we need to be able to have people move, people and goods move freely from the following general direct pattern, travel patterns and volumes of people, solve it. And there might be an infrastructure heavy solution, like expanding a rail network. There might be a technology heavy solution, like a app that I don't know about that creates more ride sharing and use of autonomous vehicles. And I think actually the more we shift to outcome bidding, it goes back to your question about unsolicited proposals, but we might actually, the market might tell us the answer to that question. Yeah, but don't you think they're complementary rather than replacing? Because, for example, if you have the mass Probably. transit, to get to the mass transit, yeah. that will be a solution because people are coming from different places. But the, I think the mass transit will always be there yeah. as the backbone. I think if, if Phil, if, uh, Phil Verser from Metrolinx was here, this is more his area than mine, but he would say, so far, what I think Metrolinx at least views is that the first mile, last mile yeah. type of challenges mm -hmm. are yes. where the first application of things like autonomous vehicles will come. If your mm -hmm. vehicle can pick you up at home, or not your vehicle, a ride-shared vehicle, pick you up at home, bring you back to the station, and then go park. I don't need to invest in parking or in the feeder yeah, network exactly. to get to the... Exactly, yeah. It, uh, the, the full experience from home to your, the place you go. Any mm -hmm. uh, thing to add on that? Or? Yeah, so as, a, as an authority, we're cooperating with the university, Salford University. We've got them an autonomous vehicle to play with. Um, and that's designed to try and say, what are the rule sets around autonomous vehicles? We're also looking at uh, operating a platooning of autonomous vehicles for freight between uh, Stockport, one of the towns southeast of us, out to the airport uh, to try these things. And it's rather, we'd rather be on the front foot yeah. and say, okay, you know, this, this is not us being killed off. Uh, this is us taking it on and saying, okay, how can we use it and actually make it part of the transit system, not a challenger to. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, Aaron, Amanda, and John, thank you for this great panel. Uh, I think we learned a lot of, uh, of insight uh, that we can bring back and use, and uh, we are around uh, if you are, have other questions in the attendance, but that will be the end of this session. Thank you, everybody, for being thank here. Thanks, Chantal. Thank you.